Long one, what's so great about Konosuba from Mother's Basement? We've watched this guy's video before. There's another Isekai video I want to check out from him. That's his video. Go give him a like. I'm already going to like it. Go share the video. Let's see what he has to say about how great Konosuba really is. Hot take! Sometimes it's really funny, but sometimes when the jokes don't land, I feel like I have to laugh because I'm putting on a performance. But sometimes I'm like, this shit just ain't hidden. But most of the time, that's good. Every time Konosuba rolls back around for a new season, it feels like old friends coming to visit. Specifically the kind of old friends your wife and lawyer beg you to stop seeing because you're one strike away from hard time, which also explains why you only see them every couple years. This is getting a little bit too personal. I think Mother's Facements going through some shit, bro come to think of it. Of course, in real life, it's not legal trouble or prison keeping Kazuma and the gang away, probably. Just the regular trials and tribulations of the anime industry, where most attempts at isekai and comedy adaptations never get a second season at all. And in that- Do they? Maybe in the past, but recently, every fucking show, because of how, how much, you know, the anime industry in Japan is trying to push for not- Quant sorry, not quality, but for quantity, I feel like a lot of shitty isekais that just been getting second season is every, every, other, like, every other season now, as of recent. Back in the day, not really, but like, now it feels like any fucking shitty isekai, any, any mid-anime just gets a second season greenlit immediately. Light, it's pretty damn impressive how these lovable idiots have kept coming back and thriving over the last near decade. Spin-offs, video games, three seasons, and a movie. Success mm -hmm. far less dubious anime heroes could never dream of. So, what is it that keeps us coming back to Konosuba? What- it's just a comedy. It's about... I mean, I think season one for a lot of people was a shock, not realizing what kind of anime it was going to be. Then it was almost like this sarcastic way of approaching an isekai where they already know the tropes and cliches and they're trying to just make fun of it. And that was like a refreshing take. And ever since then, I just got so immersed into the gang and every new season, it's like the gang is back. Makes so many of us love this stupid anime so damn much. That's what I'm here to figure out with a little help from today's sponsor, you. Specifically, mm. those of you who support the channel via memberships or on Patreon. Check out his Patreon. Go to his Patreon. Go to his Patreon. Go to his Patreon. Go to his Patreon. And then now, Help here we go. me make more cool videos like this one. Just click the link in the doobly-doo and then do Patreon stuff. It's a Patreon. You don't need me to explain how it works. Let's get back to Konos. I don't think call to action and stuff like this, to be honest, really works. Like, you can't make people watch an ad segment. They don't give a fuck. The Patreon needs to make people want to go watch without you having to advertise. I know it's always good to have like a call to action, but in terms of marketing, I've noticed that like begging for patrons never works. That's why I never do that shit. I just simply have the logo out and just give you the content. But the people know that there's more content there. And if the product that's supposed to be marketing the Patreon is already good, then that already creates an incentive to do so anyways. It's a Patreon. You don't need me to explain how it works. Let's get back to Konosuba. Konosuba? The most obvious aspect of this anime's allure is without question its bouncy, expressive, fluid mm, animation, bouncy. which puts it right up there with Nichi Joe, Gumball, Smiling Friends, and Golden Age Looney Tunes at the absolute peak of pure visual comedy. Well, not purely visual, the voice actors obviously deserve just as much credit yep. as the animators for any truly great cartoon. <laughs> I even got your parents' approval, Megumin's parents. But yeah, I think the voice acting definitely is so integral in a show like Konosuba where when you're reading the manga or the light novel, I, it's a totally different experience because you're reading it in your own voice and you know, you're reading just text, but when it comes to animation, the voice acting plus the usage of the soundtracks, understanding which soundtracks to use when to elicit certain types of emotion, different sound effects, this all goes to create the comedic experience on animation, you know, form. <laughs> So basically, loud equals funny. Yep, just scream. Just scream and the kids will find you funny. You know that meme of like loud equals funny from like, I don't know, people that like hate on Kai Sinat or a lot of big streamers that has a lot of children audience? Obviously to an extent, you know, the reason why 
a lot of people do like those called zoomer edits where it's just like every half a second something else is happening different sound effect it's because children that they're marketing the content towards who are the main demographic are fucking brain rot and has so much ADHD they just need more stimulation it's not about what you say it's about how fast can you keep things on screen and keep them stimulated to keep watching it even though they're not really understanding anything anyways loud equals funny and you know what so do sound directors, animation's most unsung heroes. Obviously all this slapsticks. I would say that the sound directors are just as equal as the voice acting, if not more important. Those two, the voice acting and the soundtrack truly makes Konosuba a unique comedic experience. Dakuga speaks for itself. And speaking of speaking, any fan who's even a little up on their behind the scenes knowledge will credit Jun Fukushima for ad-libbing Kazuma's right, funniest Kazuma running gag. But few appreciate how that slapstick would fall on its face in a different, far less funny way if it weren't for the sound design of Yoshikazu Iwanami, not to mention the music of Masato Koda, two of the production pillars who've been holding Konosuba up since day one. And they're not the only ones. Animation producer Nobumitsu Urasaki, general producer Rie Ogura, character designer Koichi Kikuta, it's nice that he's definitely bringing a spotlight to a lot of the people behind the scenes that doesn't get the recognition, but like, holy fuck, I have no idea. I'm not going to memorize any of them. I don't have a face to you know, attach their memory with. I wish I got to see a face or something with each, you know, name of it, but the unsung heroes of the show right now. Writer Makoto Uezu and director Takaomi Kanasaki, who also storyboards most episodes, have also all Bald. been with the series from the very... This one was probably one of the funniest gags. Something about ultra super macho men acting super uwu. And as he slapped Kazuma, punched him, that was... That was, that shit was fucking peak. Very ...beginning, and that is the real secret behind Konosuba's consistently impressive and hilarious production values. Many anime fans mistakenly attribute nice animation to high budgets, but budgets are generally the same across the industry and way lower than you'd probably imagine. Good planning is what really separates the cream mm. from the anime crop, and because they've worked so closely with the same producers for so long, Kanasaki and Uezu are able to tailor their storyboards and scripts to suit the schedules and needs of the animators and staff, spacing out the money shots with simpler, more limited gags to give the animators time to breathe and avoid the quality decay that plagues so many mid-tier anime in the mid- Basically, we all have a limited amount of budget. The animation is actually not that amazing, but it seems really consistent and stable and delivers on the impactful moments because they know how to min-max their budgets and have these different types of animations that's, you know, less costly is what he's getting at. It's season, for instance, sandwiched between the huge battles and high energy gags of season three, we find episode seven, which opens with an off-screen audio gag of Kazuma and Aqua mm. being obnoxious in a restaurant I remember for like that. half a minute. Follow that was when they had a shitload of money and they were just like, oh yes, we're restauranteers now. Followed by some impeccably timed awkward pauses. You know what? This, bro, season three was an L for me simply because Mohawk Man had no fucking lines. What happened? Mohawk Man was an integral part of a Konosuba experience. He would have like three to five lines throughout the season where each line was a fucking zinger. I know he's anime only, but he was so loved that he made it into Isekai Quartet. And like, they showed him in season three. But they, for whatever reason, the Mohawk Man gags were absent. I was waiting for him to do something when we saw him at the fucking wedding, at the finale episode. Yet nothing. It's like, come on, man. Half the reason I watched this shit is for the Mohawk Man. He's actually my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pauses. A genius way to have low budget moments because you're not doing anything here, but because of the planning and what kind of show this is, it works for Konosuba. You can stop jiggling your mouse. YouTube's not buffering. That's just how long they hold. I had to do that shit for Days of My Stepsister as well. And Days of My Stepsister. The, uh, the, the common talking points of defense of why it is acceptable to have a 40 second scene where nothing happens but the two siblings are just eating is in order to set the mood, the ambiance. 
You don't actually believe that shit. Shut the fuck up. You don't need 40 seconds to do that. Everyone knows this shit's fucking shameless. Listen, I understand that they're trying to set the mood and the tone, but there's different ways of doing it. You don't have to have a 40 second fucking still frame of them just fucking eating at a table to make the audience feel like, oh, this is fucking peak cinema. Honestly, the people I hate the most recently, it's kind of shifted from the light novel neckbeards that wants to gatekeep the anime onlys and feel superior to them by coming into every video and every chat and trying to act like they know more. Like Slime and Mushoku Tensei. Those turbo virgins are pretty much, I've gotten used to them. The fucking people that makes this like stays with my stepsister as like such a fucking drama, such a fucking cinema, as if it's the best work of art they've ever fucking seen. The amount of glaze. Listen, I can tell that it's like a good show, but come on now. The amount of fucking stroking they're doing for Days of My Stepsister is actually retarded. Hold on this shot. This is Evangelion elevator scene tier storyboarding right here. And I mean that as the highest compliment. Smart time-saving techniques like this were how Gynax got good enough at Gynaxing to have a whole style of boob animation named after them in the first place. And <laughs> I love this visuals. <laughs> The amount of jiggle physics going on here, bro. After them in the first place. Another tradition that Kono Suba Shika. proudly carries on. It's not common in the industry for a show's core staff to stay this consistent for this long, especially not when the show jumps studios. Typically, at least some of these high-level roles get shuffled around. So, season three was a separate studio, was it? I'm not really sure, but if that was, I wonder if that's why Mohawk Man had no fucking lines this season compared to season two and one. Between seasons, due to scheduling conflicts and the like, and you need only look at the Megumin spin-off anime to see how much that really matters. Only half of the core team was available to work on it, and while it is still very funny, it's clearly missing some of Konosuba's spark. Though as you well, I'd say that the reason that Megumin spin-off series did so bad relative to other Konosuba content, we're talking pure YouTube viewership right now, is because people don't give a fuck about Megumin and Union only. They want the whole core gang. But also, if you looked at the side spin-off story, eh, I felt like it was pretty much the Konosuba that I knew. But obviously not with the same level of polish. As you'd expect from the star, it does still have the showier kinds of combustion down. Yeah, the explosions are good. But, of course, a well-planned adaptation wouldn't be worth very much if the source material itself weren't worth adapting in the first place. And Natsume Akatsuki's sharp, witty writing is what really defines Konosuba's charm. The series based- <laughs> Just the absolute state of the fucking war. Poor Demon Lord's army, bro. Poor Demon Lord's Harvey. I feel bad for them. Please leave them alone. ...finds Konosuba's charm. The series' basic premise is a blatant send-up of the most popular isekai tropes around the time it was written. Instead of getting hit by Truck-kun, for instance, mm. this hero's sleep-deprived gamer brain merely mistakes a tractor for him and instantly sends itself into fatal shock. That's the thing, he didn't even get hit by a fucking tractor, he thought he did, and he's like, you died from fucking shock. So the goddess of reincarnation, who's kind of an asshole, starts mocking him relentlessly. He did piss himself too. ...about that, which prompts him to pick her as his obligatory cheat item out of yeah. spite, and now they're stuck together as they start their lives. And that's pretty unique, right? You have an isekai character that chooses the goddess, right? What happens when you get an isekai? Usually you go to the separate domain before you get reincarnated and there's some being that gives you powers and OP weapons and shit. But this time it's like, all right, we're just taking the fucking goddess. As adventurers, which are basically just glorified temp workers until they earn enough cash to buy a sword. Because this ain't one of them kami isekais where they just hand you 500 gold in a backpack for showing up with black hair and a funny name. Hence why those cheat items Kazuma spitefully ignored were so important, but Aqua does resurrect him slightly more often than she gets him killed, so probably he could have- Yeah, honestly, we do get bailed out so fucking much. The amount of resurrections is insane. 
Honestly, the resurrection scene has been just turned into a fucking running gag where every time it's just like, oh, it's time to go see Eris. Picked worse, maybe. And most importantly, thanks to her, he's never lonely. Yes, the real treasure here is all the gold that Kazuma buys his big house with. But the friends he makes along the way and shares it with come a close second. And yeah. as we get to know folks around the starting town, and especially the two other horrible crazy ladies who won't stop following him, the show's comedy quickly elevates itself from the rote genre parody that so many of these f***ing things make so unbearably f***ing unfunny into something that simply works no matter how many isekai you've seen. It's easy to forget with how crowded the genre's gotten, but when Konosuba came out in 2016, the gold rush had barely started and hmm. barely any of the Naro-style reincarnation isekai it was spoofing had actually been adapted to anime yet. But there was like a lot of isekais in light novels, right? 2016. When did ReZero come out? Around that same time, right? So like, that was pretty much like the beginning of the isekai gold rush in anime format. Even though there was a lot of works to be adapted that hasn't been adapted yet. And you're, get, you're seeing a lot of random ass isekais get pumped out recently as well. Light novels certainly weren't getting localized back then either. So Konosuba served as many a weeb's introduction to the very tropes mm. it was spoofing. And yet that didn't stop us from laughing our asses off. It True, right? You would think that if this is like a new, like if, if isekai was still a foreign concept to the masses watching anime, and then there is a parody of isekai that's coming out before all the other isekais come out and it's still holding its ground. Shows like how good this show actually is. It was an immediately massive hit with the English anime fandom, directly spurring that gold rush Mark. on to even greater levels of fervor, which is a real testament to just how strong its writing and characters are. But the greater testament is how almost a decade into that isekai gold rush with so many half ass <laughs> Oh, as soon as he says ins uh, half ass, we see instant death. And you know what? Let's get serious for a second. Let's get, let's get totally serious. Y'all remember watching this shit? I remember watching this shit on a week by week basis. At a certain point, I had to turn my brain off because of how fucked the pacing was. It, it, this anime was trash. It was fun. It was fun to watch, but nobody understood the story. Because they're cramming in like 300 chapters in like one episode and just like rushing everything. And it's honestly, I just watched it for the bizarreness of all the other characters having stupid ass powers. But yeah, instant death. It's not a good anime, right? Gold Rush with so many half-assed parodies biting their shtick every year. Konosuba's ensemble can come back from a five-year hiatus and immediately have us rolling like they never left. And what's more... I would argue that they did a little prep, right, with the movie and as well as the Megamine spinoff. It wasn't just a raw five-year, you know, extension, uh, sorry, hiatus from, like, season two. Well, if you're talking about purely Konosuba, yes, but there was, like, Konosuba still content going on. But, yeah, people just adore the show. They're going to keep coming out and they're going to wait for it. And when season four comes out in who, who knows many, many years, it's the same thing's going to happen. More managed to deliver the most triumphant, emotionally satisfying story this anime has told to date. Yeah, I, I did really enjoy season three ending. Season three ending, like, it for sure... It, it felt like... I, I don't know. There doesn't need to be a plot for Konosuba. It doesn't have to be serious, but the way that we, like, save darkness and darkness is bad and everything was fine as with, like, a little plot twist with, you know, the demons, like, that shit was pretty hype. Most triumphant, emotionally satisfying story this anime has told to date. Welcome home. Which is, I think, one of the biggest keys to this series, staying power. In a similar vein to Discworld, despite being a parody, Konosuba manages to build a more convincingly lived-in setting than most fantasy ever manage, and way more original to boot, populated with fascinating characters. From the ruffians sure. at the Adventurers Guild, to haughty nobles and impetuous royalty, to the surprisingly good-natured demons around town, to, of course, everyone's favorite gang of idiots. And great characters Characters are the foundation of great storytelling, so that True. naturally leads to better, more memorable arcs than most of its more serious isekai and fantasy light novel competitors. By the same token, Koichi Kikuta- I feel like there is this 
thing about anime is that it takes themselves too seriously. I've noticed that the anime that's always trying to be so serious and dark and edgy quite often fails at doing so because it just seems kind of cringe. And the perfect example might be like Eminence and Shadow, which contrasts that, right? They know they're super fucking cringe. They know that they're super embracing the cringe. But because of that, people don't really take it seriously. And suddenly, they, when they try to have serious moments, suddenly it's so much more impactful. I think a common uh, example that people give is for the show called Gintama. I haven't seen it, but the example is because the show approaches this in like a slice of life chill way, then suddenly when you have a serious arc, that tone of the serious arc is so much more heightened in the viewer's experience compared to another anime where it's always been serious. So in the Konosuba example, it's because it's always just chill and goofy and funny and comedic that when you try to have a serious thing going on, some drama, it's like, oh my god, the contrast from what you expect and what you're seeing creates that much of a better experience. So it's kind of like a buff to kind of take, it, uh, take an approach of don't take the enemy seriously, kind of joke around, be comedic, but then introduce some serious elements and then it feels so crazy. Maybe that's why Isekai Shikaku right now is also feeling that way to comedically simplified character designs built for fluid, high energy motion also naturally lend themselves to better animated action scenes than a lot of action focused anime, many of which employ- <laughs> Yes, Newgate, I'm absolutely down to shit on, yes. Oh my God, this is episode one animation. He should have shown episode 12 animation, bro. The finale animation for this series, Newgate, is unbelievably bad. It's actually like one person left in the studio and that person also, you know, ended work early and like the faces aren't even aligning with like their fucking eyes and noses. Restrictive, over detailed designs that emphasize looking cool over moving cool. And that- Yeah, this shit did not look cool either. None of this shit was cool. It's just like, I've already seen the fucking black sword, man. This dude, by the way, is called a black blacksmith. It's fucking kitty toe. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit different. But yeah, like, again, with the shitty CGI as well. Like, how the fuck are you gonna have an anime that's predated on, like, fights and hype scenes, but then have CGI Skull Knights here? I can't take this shit seriously. You want to have a show that's all about the fucking hype fight? You can't be fucking around with animation like this. The story is ass and the fight is ass. The fuck am I watching for? The pair of tits on the sisters, bro. The princesses? That's it. Shni? Tiara? The princess, that's it, dude! And that's not the only advantage that Konosuba's fights have over your average serious power fantasy. Most anime that try to emulate RPGs don't even rise to the level of a bog-standard Dragon Quest clone. That is a strategically varied series of back-and-forth combat encounters punctuated by plot dumps and the occasional puff puff. With your average Kirito's stats and skills at endgame levels from the outset, most isekai strategy boils down to hit it with the sword then mm -hmm. the biggest spell you got if that doesn't work. And with the animators spending all their energy punching that garbage up, the best you'll see outside of fights is a plaf plorf. By refusing to take its characters or action all that seriously though, Konosuba ironically fares much better in that department. No, Union, not the puff puff department. Jesus. Those are quite nice, though. What I mean is, it comes much closer to the improvisational feel of real tabletop roleplay. Megumin okay. has an undeniably OP endgame attack, but she can only use it outside once. once per day and refuses to learn anything else. Aqua has the busted stats of a Kirito, but sinks all her skill points into party tricks for attention instead of anything useful. Darkness is too, uh, easily Tank. distracted to hit anything with her sword, and Kazuma's dog water Luck. class means he can learn lots of abilities, but his stat line is also dog water, so only the luck-based ones are particularly useful on their own. Overwhelming the enemy with sheer force is basically never an option for these goofballs, especially not after Megumin shoots her shot for the day and becomes a doormat. So in basically every encounter, they're forced to think on their feet, combine their powers creatively, and fight dirty no i see i see so instead of having like an isekai protag that goes out and just clutches by himself everyone has a role right mega means glass cannon nuke darkness tank but can't fucking hit for shit aqua useful against the demons due to her holy counter but quite often very useless against a lot of things and kazuma 
he's got really nothing except a lot of thief roguelike skills and a lot of luck. And by having each, you know, team member excel at different fields, you can have more of like a, a synchronized team work that seems more, again, like a tabletop RPG. Darkness, not that kind of dirty. Still nice though. I'm talking about stuff like creating water and then freezing it to make an improvised oil slick. Using the impersonation skills that come- That, that imperse- dude. Aqua's buffs in season 3 was crazy. I've never seen her be more useful in my fucking life. The- whatever the one that gives, you know, Kazuma peak performance, the confidence. Also, as well as him being able to voice act as darkness, bro. Like, holy shit, these buffs are crazy. Come bundled with Aqua's seemingly useless multi-threat entertainer buff to misdirect enemy mobs or stealing the enemy's sword before Steal. they even have a chance to strike or their underwear, as the case may be. Come to think of it, most of those are pretty cowardly, but hey, so is Kazuma. That's yeah, one of fair. the benefits of having a pro tag who doesn't have to be the coolest guy in the room at every possible moment. And I like that. That's why Kazuma may be one of the most relatable and probably one of my favorite Isekai characters where he's not this like super OP person. Well, he kind of seems like, like that now, but like on paper, he's not, right? He doesn't have any superpowers. He does have a lot of utility shit, but he's got a lot of luck and to a certain degree, a lot of charisma. And I like how he deals with situations and threats with his team rather than, you know, just fucking the black blacksmith, just, you know, cutting us shit things down in one hit and be like, oh, wow, that was so cool. Or ever. The underwear thing in particular is a great example of characterization through action, too. Because Kazuma's luck stat is so high, yeah. it makes the normally randomized steel skill effectively an at-will guaranteed hit every time, but he And he's so lucky that he pulls the panties, that's your point? He's such a worthless pervert that he can only steal panties, never anything valuable or useful, because he values those the most, unless he's fighting a dude, of course. Of course, that also makes makes Kazuma a prime example of what's typically one of the most aggravating archetypes in anime that drew Link Fletcher, but a few yeah. key facts make his version of the bit substantially funnier than, say, Mineta or Meliodas, at least in my book. Firstly, Kazuma has layers and depth to his character beyond just being a horny piece of shit. He's a, He's a pedo neat. What else does he have? Also a greedy, lazy, irritable, cowardly piece of shit, not yeah. to mention unaccountably vain, which leads him to try and almost always fail to hide his copious flaws instead of flaunting them, which means that, you know, you don't see him act like Mineta too often, except around the rest. Yeah, I, I guess like that part of the lecherous guy, the archetype, being too pervy in public all the time is fucking annoying, right? But I guess Kazuma only does that really in closed doors and privacy. Most of his party, of course, because he knows the best worst girls are just as bad as he is, if not worse. Zis the one too made a great point in the comments of that old video, actually, that part okay. of the reason the girls click so well with Kazuma is each of them shares, and I'd argue- Huh, they all have a little piece of Kazuma in them. Aqua's selfish and entitled. Megami short-tempered. Darkness perverted. Yeah? Yeah, true. Kazuma is each of them shares, and I'd argue amplifies, some of his negative traits. Darkness is a way bigger perv than he is by a wide margin, for example. To the point it makes even him- I see. So basically, Kazuma is well-received and people don't really hate him compared to other characters that he's shown because the characters around Kazuma excel at more perverted things, uh, at more degenerate things. All the shitty qualities that was shown, it's even more heightened through those characters and with them leading and Kazuma kind of chasing, it makes it funny and not annoying. A little uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> They're both freaks who could <laughs> be treated as a luggage. Darkness is honestly too fucking wild. And like every time you would think it gets boring, but the masochism, you know, running gag just continues to just get, get more hype. Very easily get their freak on together if they really wanted and yeah. almost do a few times, but neither of them is actually ready for that despite how vocally they want it. Not emotionally, certainly not in terms of body fluid supply, not to mention the potential fallout the ensuing relationship could cause within their party. Remember Chilchuck's rules for adventuring, kids? What is it? The hilarious paradox 
crux of the masochistic paladin is that deep down, even if she's not pure by any stretch, she is no, she is pure. She's purely degenerate. As pure-hearted as she pretends to be, she's a naive idealist who cares about her friends and the people in her noble charge immensely and would sacrifice anything, go through any pain for their sake. Every no, it's not for their sake. No, that's an excuse that she makes. This goddamn paladin is out there trying to fucking tank the aggro. Not for their sake but because she loves the pain. The thing she does through season three proves that beautifully. Does the fact that she'd also get off on that pain really cheapen that sacrifice all that much? Definitely yes. At any rate, it's for the best that Kazuma's too skittish to finger that trigger because he and Megumin are a much better match. As Kazuma Megumin or Kazuma Darkness? Honestly, in terms of just like pure vibes, Megumi and Kazuma get along really well. The movies are really pushing them together. I mean, even Megumi's parents want that shit to happen only because Kazuma is rich and Megumi's mom is trying to get out of poverty by trying to fucking <laughs> perhaps get Megumi knocked up so that Kazuma has no other way to get out. Kazuma Aqua, they're just kind of like best friends yeah i don't see her as like a waifu no no shot she is like she's weird she's just like a best friend that you might party with megumin and kazuma though in terms of pure vibes maybe this is the better batch as far as flaws go they're both immensely childish prone to tantrums and all around selfish but that goes hand in hand with their shared best quality that they're both shamelessly passionate nerds in kazuma's case it's mostly for games and anime which he can't really get his hands on anymore while the chief object yo what the fuck hold up can't really Okay, I was gonna say, like, is this supposed to be, like, uh, I, I saw maybe this is Darkness, this is Aqua, I was looking for a Megumin to show, it, like, if in a past life, the video game cover kind of imitated what, you know, Cosmos Party would be in the future, but I don't think so. ...to get his hands on anymore, while the chief object of Megumin's nerdery is, of course, the overwhelming beauty, godly, destructive might, and sublime, magical elegance of... Except it all! So long as she can explode something once a day, Megumin is happy, and Kazuma gets that. More than he gets maybe anything about any other person. The first thing we ever see him volunteer to do in this wonderful world that doesn't benefit him in any way is carry Megumin back from explosion True. practice, and he... And what were we doing? We were fucking up the Dulahan's castle. Poor guy just wanted to live in peace, and we were out there nuking it every day. Clearly has a blast doing it. Pun very much intended. Just a few weeks in, he starts to really appreciate the intricacies of her obsession, the difference between a great explosion and a merely okay one. He Yeah, we even had like a rating system, right? Of like, how good was this one? And there'd be a little feedback, and every day we carry her back after the explosion. Just... It's the moments that they spend together are very genuine and very authentic. And yes, it's the whole pedo neat joke is still going along. But if we're talking about just pure, just like relationships and like how they interact with each other, Megumin Kazuma seem, does seem like a better match than Megumin Darkness. Sorry, Dark Kazuma Darkness. What about Kazuma Eris? No, not yet. Is there anyone else? Cosma, anyone else? I don't think there really are any other girls that he interacts with. Takes an interest in her interests, which is the basis for all great nerd love stories. Yeah, they have the whole song. They have the whole song. The princess? Hey, we're talking about romantic potential romance, okay? We're not talking about fucking babysitting our little sister, even though that... Technically, according to the prophecy, like, he's supposed to marry her now, right? Because, like... What was it? The ring? I forget. It, <laughs> we'll, have, we'll, we'll give her 10 years. They're not really ready for a relationship either, though. At this point, Megumin, Kazuma, and Darkness are mostly just using each other as emotional crutches. And, you know, frankly, it'd just be inappropriate for them to get up to. Yeah. 
come on, like, come on now. No matter how much Megumi's mom is down for this, it's just kind of a bad look. Do anything with a whiny little baby in the house. Aqua shares Kazuma's laziness and especially his vanity, which she needs the rest of the party to constantly validate because pretty much no one else really likes her, not even her own cult. Fuck Aqua, bro. Aqua is just an annoying alcoholic. But, but season three, she put in a lot of work. I, I genuinely respect the amount of value that she provided by buffing Cosma. Hunter down. Also, she's a day drinking. She, yeah, she's a day drinker, but like, she has an exceptional talent. And that exceptional talent is like street performance, but she takes offense when people like give her money for the street performance because like she's not out there begging for money. She has like a some level of pride with like the street performance she does. It's very interesting. Being alcoholic with a taste for the expensive stuff or actually even that's giving her too much credit. She canonically can't distinguish between good and, and cheap bad. booze. She just it's just fucking pretentious, right? It's like, oh, yes, I want the finest wine in the cellar. Prefers to drink, quote, expensive bubbly because it costs more. Literally the worst. And when she's hammered, she's an easy mark for door-to-door -door scams. If Kazuma's insane- Hey, we don't know if Emperor Zell is a scam or not yet, okay? Until that thing hatches, we have no confirmation, but it's, it's probably not going to be a fucking dragon. Main Luxstat wasn't constantly leading the gang into improbably lucrative get-rich-quick schemes. She'd have long ago drunken them out of luckily acquired mansion and home. Though, to her credit, she did also get them that mansion in the first place by botching a simple graveyard clearing gig oh, and yeah. accidentally haunting up the entire rich that neighborhood was a in which mansion. it's situated, leading the NIMBY landlord to... Uh, just sort of let them live there as hush money in order to not drive housing prices down. And you know what? She does clearly belong in that sort of fancy gated community, not because she's particularly classy or dignified or whatever, but she's because pretentious. she's such an open racist. <laughs> she's just an open racist. She is though. I love how he's going off about the fucking NIMBYs as well here with the house value. She hates the demons, but the demons hate her too. And it's just this like instinctive thing because of a natural clash against like good and bad of like, I don't know, pure and evil. I mean, it says you. Sucks on negative human emotion to barely manage existing. I feel like every time you're around, it's just negative emotions. <laughs> Look at this shit. Despite the fact. Look at that shit. She is the fucking demon in the conversation. That time and again, demons and undead have been shown to be some of the nicest and most yep. productive members of Konosuba's yep. entire society. True. Like, Aqua herself has objectively caused more problems for this wonderful world just by losing track of all the cheat items she handed to dead Jap- That's very true. Aqua has done more damage to this world than any other fucking demon general has, maybe. Japanese kids before she even got here, not to mention all the f up since then. It's not just Wiz and Veneer being upstanding citizens with their little item shop either. Beldia the Dullahan put up with Megumin exploding yes. his house every- The training arc. He just wanted to chill in his fucking castle. And he's a, he's a nice guy. And then they came to his place every day unwarranted and nuked that shit. No wonder he got mad and tried to attack our place. Every day for months before he even came to complain about it. Let and that's my favorite thing is how we are literally rooting for this guy and we can empathize with this guy because of the dumb shittery that we're doing. And that's just P. Konosuba humor. You're literally rooting for the Demon Lord General. Alone attacked the city of Axel. And even then, he would have let it go at any point if she just apologized. So reasonable. Such reasonable people. Plus, prior to that, him being there reduced the rate of local monster attacks, which was only a problem for the adventuring economy of the city, not the actual people. He was what the fuck? You're right. The more I think about it, 
he was literally the guardian. And he was maintaining that like no one else would come here because he was such a threat that he wouldn't fuck with anyone else either. He's like a guardian. But then the adventurers, they need shitty monsters to farm because that's how they make their money. So the adventures of the bat, that's that, okay. Holy shit, that could be an isekai show right there, right? It's a twist where like, the isekai is like basically this premise where the adventures and them, the whole guild system, it's all fucked up. They're always constantly need, you know, threats because that's how they make their money. I could totally see a story like that go well. It was such a nice guy who simply did not deserve that kind of abuse or True. Darkness's frankly outrageous sexual harassment. And while the other Demon King generals do engage in more overt acts of villainy, yeah. the Crimson Demons are kind of jerks. And I feel bad for, uh, you know, the, the people against, like, the Crimson Witches. This shit is a fucking warm up. It's it's not a war. It's a display of power. It's not even fucking fair. Honestly, we're the bad people. These are kind of jerks. And Hans was only trying to disrupt the activities of. The Hans went crazy. The Axis cultists literally drove Hans to it, like this madness, bro. Disrupt the activities of the aforementioned Axis cult, which is awful on a level that makes Insane happy people. science look reasonable. Is that the Oh, the fucking kid, dude. The kid got us so good. <laughs> no, don't write it! <gasps> so close. <laughs> and see what I mean? Again, the soundtrack, right? The transition from this happy-go-lucky theme of a seemingly innocent, pure child, and then immediately you get boss music playing, and it just creates that, you know, comedy. <laughs> <gasps> yep. <laughs> and loud equals funny. And the reason they're so awful is explicitly Aqua. because Aqua. they worship and follow the very poorly thought out teachings of Aqua, who I'm just realizing now I've yet to list a single redeeming quality for, so... What redeeming quality is there for Aqua? What ha when has she been genuinely a good person? She was useful, but doesn't mean she's a good person. I guess one quality that I find, you know, that I can respect, again, is the street performing merchantry shit. Where she like puts on a performance, people donate money, and she's like, no, 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 I'm not doing this for money. I'm creating art here, and I'm like, you know what, that's kind of funny. I, I can respect that, but is that a good quality? I don't know. Hmm, let's see. Sometimes she uses her incredible healing magic to yes. save people's- Again, but again, being useful is not a good quality. That's what I'm saying. Wives, usually with the worst possible dramatic timing. And that's pretty much how it worked in at the end of season 3 as well. We're just like, oh no, bad things happening. Is there any way this can be saved? Nako comes out of nowhere. And then like, you know, purify the dad as well. It's all fine. Yeah. She's also an incessant people pleaser, like many narcissists. But you know, when, when company's over, she's always willing to brew up a fresh pot of tea, even though her goddess powers instantly purify the tea out of the yeah, tea. Yeah, it's just water, so right? Kind of just constantly boiling water, serving their guests cups of hot water. She's kind of just the worst, huh? She sucks. Like, aside from that one fat old pervert, Aqua's low-key more of a villain than most of Konosuba's villains. Not on- <laughs> I am so down with Mother's Basement about this. I've been hating on Aqua since fucking day one, and a lot of people just finds her hot, and they let their head, not up here, but the one down there, you know, decide how they feel about Aqua. I don't know, man. Like, I think that she can be funny at times. And I think that she was extremely useful in season three. But is she in the in, in like a character chart of my favorite characters in Konosuba of the girls? Like she's probably dead last. On purpose, 
mostly. Never mistake for malice what can be chalked up to stupidity. But she's definitely one of the friends like these that makes you think, who needs enemies? Which yeah. brings me to the main thing that makes Kazuma's lucky pervert bit, and most of the other horrible things about these characters, not just tolerable, but outright entertaining. The personal failings of the party, perviness included, are by and large what drive Konosuba's plot forward. The Devil King's army just isn't that much of a problem for everyday people, so with few exceptions, every episode and arc of the series so far can be boiled down to, well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions. Basically, we're playing on extra difficulty. If we could just fight the Demon Lord army, we could win. But it'd be too easy. The bulk of the story and all the drama stems from our own fuck-ups, which usually Aqua is responsible for. Even the ones where they fight the Demon King's generals. If it's not Kazuma's perverse habits almost getting him, plus an innocent succubus sex worker, killed <laughs> by his racist roommate, it's a get-rich-quick scheme that. gone horribly wrong. Or worse, horribly right. It's as if the gang is constantly in search of new petards by which to be hoist. Konosuba's comedic dynamic is often likened by fans to it's always sunny in another world, and that's not a bad comparison at all, but I don't know if it fully captures the series' distinctive charms, especially the fact that its status quo actually evolves over time. Bringing it back to the tabletop RPG analogy, I like to look at Konosuba as a D&D campaign where the players absolutely are not taking it seriously, and yeah. the DM absolutely is, but doesn't believe in railroading. There is an overarching story to play out, a rich, creatively built world full of cool characters to discover, but everyone's kind of too focused on goofing off, cracking jokes, and just kind of doing stuff for the sake of their own characters to find any of that. So instead of forcing things, the DM lets them have their fun and slowly, surreptitiously inserts plot points and lore bits from the story he wants. But that sounds fun. That sounds like a D&D campaign I'd be down for. Rather than a bunch of sweatlers trying to fucking min-max and metagame everything. Just a bunch of people just trying to have fun in their own way and just goofing around and creating fun, hilarious situations. Sounds like a fun time. ...to tell into the consequences of their constant f uppery. This is, in my humble opinion, the most fun way to play a tabletop game because it allows everyone at the table to contribute their own distinct voice to the story without losing sight of that story's point. At the end of the day, the reason we play tabletop RPGs instead of just, I don't know, going bowling or whatever is because we want... I'm not gonna lie. I don't think I've ever played a tabletop RPG. Have I ever? I'm not really sure I have. Want to both goof off with our friends and feel like we really accomplished something together that we couldn't have done on our own. Something we can tell stories about later. It's the same adventurous impulse, really, that drives those friends you don't see very often, just channeled into a less risky medium than doing actual crimes. And the reason we watch anime is because the old Because our lives suck. And every day we're reminded that everything is getting worse. So we use anime as a medium to escape from our shitty situations so that at least we can find some solace and cope with all the shitty things happening in the world. The older you get, the busier your friends get. And sometimes, even when you can get together, everyone's just real tired. So yeah. it's nice having a fantasy anime that channels that same impulse and finds that perfect balance between goofing off and getting shit done that makes a great tabletop campaign great. Not the That was a beautiful way of summarizing something that I cannot, you know, relate to. But I can have an understanding of, basically, just a bunch of friends having fun and not taking it too seriously and doing our own things, which just creates more crazy, wacko situations, and that's the best way to have fun in a tabletop RPG. The only anime that doesn't mind you, I really need to watch more of The Slayers, but as modern shows go, Konosuba is unmatched. And I really hope we don't have to wait- Unmatched? I'm surprised that he didn't talk about any of the negative things about Konosuba, but then again, the title of this video is called What's So Great About Konosuba. Maybe he can do a follow-up video called What's So Bad About Konosuba and talk about some of the jokes not landing, but is Konosuba really unmatched in terms of pure comedy right now? I think it's definitely King. Mm, is there any direct competitors? 
I don't really think so. I think a lot of people are making the comparison of Isekai Shikaku being as funny as Konosuba, but I don't think it's the same type of humor. Too long before the gang comes back around to cause more problems. While we wait, though, if you're feeling Konosuba deficient, I did just put out a definitive list of the greatest Isekai anime of... And I want to watch that, but I can't because he has ReZero in there. So we'll watch that after we watch ReZero. But hey, here's the, here's the video link. Please go give Mother's Basement a sub. Like his videos if you can't. I mean, if you, if you, if you haven't. He just puts things into words that I cannot really do. I'm just a dumb reactor. I just laugh at things. But that was a beautiful way of packaging what's so great about Konosuba. And a little bit part of me just wanted to talk about like what's so bad about Konosuba. Because a lot of people glaze this shit and say, oh my god, it's the best thing ever. But I know a lot of people also think that Konosuba is sometimes very mid because the joke sometimes just falls flat on its face and it's just not the same sort of stuff that they're expecting. But hey, that can be a different video we can farm on a different day.